Doug Van Pelt from Heaven's Metal, HM Magazine, has agreed to uh, be our very special guest moderator for the Dan Spitz press conference. And in the meantime, he has graciously availed himself to us to answer questions about metal music. So if you have any questions about metal music, step right up to the microphone I am currently speaking into and ask the consummate professional about metal, Doug Van Pelt. Calling Dan Spitz until Dan Spitz arrives. Let's talk. He has um, a voicemail message anyway. Okay. First Dan. question. Isn't metal the devil's music? Metal is not the devil's music. Metal is a musical language. If you can show me one note on the musical scale that's evil, I will agree with your argument, sir. Is that like sheet metal? Here comes Dan, everybody. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, formerly from Anthrax, Mr. Dan Spitz with your very special guest host moderator, HM Magazine, Heaven's Metal, Doug Van Pelt. Doug, while we're waiting for Dan to uh, step up to the microphone, how long have you been at this? Uh, HM Magazine started 23 years ago. So you're, you're about to celebrate your 25th anniversary as well. Yep, yep, trying to catch up the cornerstone. All right. Well, I still don't see any gray. How you doing? Yes. Please welcome Mr. Peter Baltes from the band Accept. I got a new camera. Mr. Dan Spitz. Does anybody have any questions ready? Don't you? Okay. Well, I do. Is heavy metal Satan's music? Absolutely. I can play you that one note on the guitar that represents the evil Satan. You can show me the evil note? Absolutely. Okay, show me and I'll, I'll buy your <laughs> argument then. So Dan, are you formerly of Anthrax, or are you currently with Anthrax? What's the status of? Formerly of, uh, formerly of Anthrax, yes. We were uh, recently got back together to do two-year reunion, and uh, the reunion and my contractual obligations are over now. And since the day I walked off that stage, I had um, started in my studio very quietly, very secretly, uh, a new project to develop new music. That is the way I created music previously. A new kind of music, a new genre of music, whatever you might want to call it, just whatever God had put forth through me. The combination of music, the music that I love has come out, um, but this time with the words that represent how I feel, and how God makes me feel and hopefully the love that I can transmit that he tells me to through to you. Excellent. Please describe the music as best you can to us stylistically and it's what you're doing there. It's very satanic. <laughs> wow. It's notes all over the guitar that represent Satan. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> that was sarcasm. Yeah, I'm good with that. <laughs> Uh, it has anti-Satan all over it, basically. Um, it's very heavy, um, but it runs the gamut of instruments. It, it could have horns going, such as way back when, like from the Who Quadrophenia era, to really fast double bass drums, to whatever calls for the music and the message to get through and that angst that um, my guitar always represents. I think the biggest part of this music is two things. One, um, it's my voice and I'm singing. Because who better to represent what God is telling my music to do than me? So God has put forth the, through me a, a very good learning lesson of uh, learning how to be a, a great singer. Um, and number two would be one of my best friends here, Mr. Peter Baltus playing bass. Uh, from the legendary band Accept. And uh, yeah, give it up for Peter. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's other players 
on the music, uh, a lot of my friends. Um, one of them is, his name is Matt Thompson, and he's from a band called King Diamond. You're a very satanic band. The inventor of Satan bands, probably. Um, so he, he's done some drum overdubs. So you have Anthrax, Accept, King Diamond, and a lot of these name band names that you might be very familiar with. But this time the message is what it should be. Good deal. All right. Well, Dan, tell us your story. How did you come to know this person we call Jesus? No. Oh, uh, you better take a snooze, a nap. Because I'm, uh, I was brought up Orthodox Jew, Jewish, and not just brought up, but it's my bloodline that goes back five and a half thousand years. So you got it. Baruch Atah Yeah, I can speak Hebrew. That's because. The way I was brought up was in synagogues where segregation is okay and the women have to sit up upstairs and separate from the men and only Hebrew is spoken. So it's not just my upbringing, but it is my bloodline. I'm a Levite Jew uh, from the Sephardic tribe that goes back five and a half thousand years. So I'm the first black sheep in the family that has broken that bloodline and uh, gotten saved. And when someone like me gets saved, they, uh, they get their clock lead because we don't know the other side. We don't know the written word of the New Testament. We don't know what the Holy Spirit is. So we're taught from an intellectual standpoint to study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible. So when you do give your life to the Lord like me and say the sinner's prayer, um, things happen to you that can only be explained back to you by another Christian. So for those first few months when you when I got saved, there was so much unexplained things going on in my body. Um, I would call my ex sister in law up, um, who is another radically saved person who got saved in an all black church. So that should put that into perspective, um, and ask her, you know, why do I feel like I have goosebumps, but when it's everywhere and it feels like a wave, like what is this? And she would just laugh and hang up the phone and go, "You'll see, <laughs> little Jew, you'll see." You know, things like this. So it just goes to show you that God is real. And if you don't know that God is real, talk to me. Because I can tell you God is real because I have no clue of the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit lives in me. And things that have happened truly inside of me and outwardly as well that are unexplained. God is real. How's that? That's great. Thank you. What are some things you had to get over in your mind intellectually to accept Jesus as the Messiah? Intellectually? Intellectually stems back once again to having the Holy Spirit come and live inside of you. Because that wipes that intellectual part away. Because it's unexplained. And for a Jewish person to have that unexplained, it's, it's a mystery. You can only say, there is a God. And the, God truly did walk the earth. We don't have to, I don't have to wait for him as my Messiah anymore, as the Jewish faith does. Because I know for sure he is here. He has walked and he, he lives and breathes in me every day. Every day. And he brings forth miracles that, I mean, I had miracles in the secular world. Everything I've ever played on is gold or platinum or double platinum. Everything I've ever touched, be it a video, be it for music for a, um, a movie for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, so to be able to walk away from that, and not when it was descending, but when we were on top, as someone else that's speaking here this weekend, um, Brian from Corn, you're seeing now that happened to me way back in 93 to 95. So for me to walk away from that, you better know it's real. So a very similar thing has happened to Peter as well, and Peter gets offers to go back to that world and you know do your reunion and make tons of money, be world famous, and have people ask for your autograph. And it does it means nothing to him as it means nothing to me. Being in front of you and telling you what's inside of me right now means more to me than all of that. It's just junk. But more than that is, I, now I can see what, why people have ministries. And my ministry 
I can't, I can't, I have to do it through music. That's my blessing. That's what he's given me. Um, and not just being able to play my guitar. But for some reason, he has blessed me with the ability to create new things that somehow millions of people love. So if those people can love the music and the angst, now they'll have the words to love. But to love Jesus and not me or my music. That's really what, it's, what, what this new project is all about. Most of the people in the room can relate to a similar experience that when they became a Christian, a lot of their friends were the first thing on their mind to talk to and they got a diverse amount of reaction. So how have your bandmates and your friends and YouTube people, how have they reacted to the change in your life? Go ahead, Peter. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> what fan, what friends? <laughs> well, was, there's really nobody left. Uh, first they call you a nut, an idiot. Um, the lunatic, I mean, you know the words, you know, I'll go. But, you know, we have an ironic God who, who, for some reason, I don't know why, he must have picked me when I was 17 and had his eye on me because I, he kept me away from drugs. You know, I was a heavy drinker, smoker, but for some other reason, I never touched drugs. And uh, I remember in 84, we were in the studio with a band called Joshua from California, a Christian band, and they prayed before they ate and we wanted to eat and we're like, what did these loons do? Later on, years later, we had Striper opening up for us, and they, I know, but we thought, what's with these guys? You know, they prayed before the show, they have these little books, now I know what a Gideon Bible is, I threw them in there. But all along the way, I believe there were seeds laid into my life that eventually when I got saved, you know, all came to food, God was just laughing his butt off, thinking, here you got your boy now, and uh, it was the best time of my life. I, I, I had so much, you know. I, I, today I'm looking at Ozzy's kids growing up on television, you know, in and out of rehab. And when my kids were born, I was still in the band. And uh, I came home, I quit the band to be with my kids. But I was still drinking and smoking and, you know, lying to them and being in my studio at night and, you know, having my six pack. Till my wife brought, uh, went to another church and she brought uh, some people home uh, that were bread and they were like lay people. I didn't know what they were. I battled for four hours. I told them to get out of my house. I threw them out. They came back. They were really persistent. They came back and another day, and they just asked me, Peter, we, we, we just, can we pray with you? And I said, pray with me? Nobody ever prayed with me. I didn't know, you know, I was an atheist. I'm from Germany. We don't pray. We march. <laughs> so, uh, very ironic that I sit here with, you know, a German and a Jew. Jesus makes it all possible. Yeah, that's it. And it is true. Somebody once told me Jesus has a really funny sense of humor. He does. He does. Well, they prayed with me. They prayed with me for an hour and a half. We were holding hands, three guys. And uh, I was soaked from head to toe. Uh, they spoke in a weird language I didn't understand. I had no clue. But I don't think I was even on this planet at that moment. It was so intense. And they asked me if I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I did changed my whole life from that moment on. I never smoked a cigarette, never took a drink. <laughs> for 10 years now. And then, you know, the same thing. I was the radical new Christian. You did it all, read all the books, <laughs> did everything. And uh, now we're at the time in my life when my kids are growing, they have their own Christian band. Uh, we know what we are in our church. We know that we are the church, you know, that you don't believe every pastor what he says, you know, you are you and God, that's the relationship. You gotta be very careful. There's a lot of false prophets out there. So we learn all these things. And uh, today it's just a wonderful feeling to have a purpose that hole in my heart is filled. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't be thankful more. I'm just fulfilled. Dan, I understand that you uh, are a watchmaker and you took some serious time to delve into that. How did that help you uh, with the, your lifestyle change and uh, tell us a little bit about your skills with watchmaking and how that came about. Um, well, after get, getting saved, uh, I was kind of lost for a while, having to step on a stage in front of 20,000 to a quarter of a million people every night and fake it, basically. It's just miserable, laying in my bunk at night with my Bible and, you know, every, every just everything you can imagine and you read about that goes on in the road going on in your tour bus and you're the guy you're the outcast you know and um so 
when I did leave music, I it, it just um, people might have read funny things uh, online of what I said back then, and then they still hold true today. It just I just felt a disgust for music because of the music I was in, and at that time in Christian music, um, all we had. All I tried to listen to was Delirious, which is one of my favorite bands. But there's no, you know, there was no Anthrax. Where's Anthrax with Jesus lyrics? You know, where, 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 where is that power? Where are the players? Where is the production? You know, when's it gonna happen? Um, so when I did retire and, and walk off the stage, I had to find something to, to do. I really didn't need to work, but I, I'm a person who likes to have extreme challenges and uh, my grandfather was a, a watchmaker and a jeweler so I set off on that path to head my way to try and repair um, the most complicated wristwatches known to mankind which is considered a master watchmaker of complications specialist so whatever that means it means that I repair like Ferrari engine cars kind of thing like there's a Rolex which is a Cadillac and then there's a Ferrari and then there's Formula One cars. So I, that's kind of where I started and where I ended up and I reached my plateau and my goal and it was very quiet. I could only hear the tick tock of you know, some of the most wonderful masterpieces that a human can create. Very quiet and solitary. So it was a wonderful time for me with the Lord, with my book. In school, trapped in Switzerland alone, laying in bed with my Bible at night with a watch book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And seeing that there is actually a lot of watchmaking stuff in the Bible too. Um, so it was a wonderful 10 years of schooling almost and, and apprenticeships, because um, in Switzerland it takes a lot longer to be what I am than a doctor or a lawyer, almost three times as long. And he gave me the blessing to have that ability to reach those plateaus, which most people don't. So I have a very wonderful gift from the Lord in that area as well. So I, once again, for me to um, have the abilities in this country, in the United States, to be what's determined really a Swiss watchmaker um, and give, stop that career and that daily routine to make music for God and for you it takes a lot out of me to make that decision as well. So I have to try to balance both. Apparently you're in good company. Uh, biblical scholars say that the Apostle Paul took between 13 months and 13 years before he really started his ministry. And so getting aside that time to be quiet and to study seems to be very significant. Well, in that, also in that time, now there's a metal scene. <laughs> you know, we have a Christian metal. You know, we got a living sacrifice playing. I mean, that's... This, this Christian metal. There's, there's good production. There's record companies. There's tours. There's this festival. That's why I'm here. Um, but uh, I just kept it secret for a few years and who would play and who wouldn't and who would be the blessing on the product and, and, and now I'm here to let everybody know where I've been and what I've been up to and why I didn't continue to make new music with, with Anthrax. So what Christian rock and metal has blown your mind? Um, funny as it sounds, I really don't listen to the type of music I create a lot of the times. So as I said previously, like. Delirious is, is pretty much my, my favorite Christian band. It's interesting, a lot of the Christian musicians, they want to get out of the Christian music industry and into the mainstream. And you've been in the mainstream and want to get out of the mainstream into the Christian industry. What lessons, if any, do you think you can learn from them and them learn from you? Well, I believe one of the main things I noticed over the years that there's, you know, a lot of secular people, most secular folks, are not aware that there's Christian music out there. And the bands sometimes, or the record companies, down. It seems to me that it's it's not made so public, and I don't know why, you know. But I uh, I would rather have it that everybody has it written on his forehead, because we do want to make a difference. And we went out on a world tour, 2005, both of us. That's where we met, where everybody else was drinking at the bar. We were at the Wi-Fi station, uh, you know, dealing with the folks at home, calling our wives and emailing, and that's how we. Figure it out, but we played festivals in Sweden, big festivals, Holland, and these are people we need to reach. They have white faces, they wear upside down crosses. They have no idea why, but that's what they do. And we had a we had a VIP tent where we ate. They were burning upside down crosses on the wall. I mean, it was as evil as it gets, and we were in the middle of it. So, in you know, in order to really make a difference, I want to make sure that everybody knows who I'm playing for. 
you know, if we don't take a stand, we fall for everything. And I think for us, it's time to take a stand. I, I think that once you really truly are saved, or you, you know Jesus, and hopefully all of you do, but obviously some people, different levels, but some people are still searching. So if you're searching, it's really time to listen. Because if two of us can sit here and decide after time off that Peter wants to get back together with Accept and do a reunion, and the first time he steps on a stage, there's a quarter of a million people looking at him and willing to spend their money on t-shirts, and obviously the same thing for, for my former band, And but we can walk away from that, but we're still lost looking for each other to make that music um, uh, for Jesus. There's more, there's more of us left behind because I'm friends with them, and they're stuck in that world, and I'd love to try to pull them out. But if, if my music or our music saves one, then that was the purpose. So I'm this time it's not me. It's not my skill. It's not me sitting in my room practicing my guitar day and night, ready to take over the world with my guitar like I did or well, tried to do <laughs> when I was young. It's, uh, it's for a completely different purpose. I don't know what that purpose is, but I'm told to do it, so I'm doing it, and I listen. And that's just the way it is, and you guys can like it or not. And it's just the way it's gonna be. Just like I did in the old days, when we created, he created music that I grew up on, I created a new music where all the record companies listened to it, and had our demo tape, and Metallica's demo tape, and they just thought it was noise. If it didn't stop us, then nothing's gonna stop me now. What are your thoughts or opinions uh, seen through your filter of faith on uh, different forms of expression like machine and pit move dancing? You want to elaborate on that? Yeah. If you're up on stage, if you're up on stage next year and you see a mosh pit form, uh, is that something you embrace? Something you think kids having fun? You jump mm -hmm. right in it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when we first started, uh, you know, moshing and that term, is, I guess, it stems from the punk era, but no one really had that word yet in heavy metal, and our concerts it wasn't allowed at any of the venues when we started. There were still seats like these, um, and when the kids started throwing the seats out, they would be thrown out. I mean, I'm talking Madison Square Garden type, type arenas. Um, so that it has been brought forth to the to I mean you can go to a concert for it's not even a heavy metal concert and the kids are, are slam dancing or moshing whatever you, you want to label it but I always looked out um, I, I think Peter will probably agree and I looked out and I would see the pits going and if they could really do the real dance I see two or three pits going and I'd be thinking okay if they don't get it out here we're gonna have a really bad world what kind of damage are they going to do if they don't get this angst, this, this pent up aggression that comes from everyday life, life out somewhere? So if it's done in a safe environment, it's almost like they went out and they get to play football or whatever this may be. But it, there really is a dance to moshing if you do your history. It is not football. If you go to Europe, right? When, we, when, when me and Peter play like Monsters of Rock, you'll, when you can see videos now on YouTube, you'll see they're dancing, it's, there's movement and there is a dance, but you'll see thousands of kids doing it in a circle and they're not getting hurt. So I, uh, it's, it's, a it's, form of it's a form of worship. It yeah, is, and it can know. be. Tell us some stories that we might find in the lyrics of your, the music you're making or some stories that have happened since you guys have been creating. Um, one song is actually about, it's my wife Candy over there, and my children, my, I have twin identical boys. Um, one of the songs is, is, I guess, a struggle or a test that, that is about them. Um, they were born with something called colic, and it's, a, it's an under, it's a disease where uh, someone's laughing, so at least they know what it is, kind of. It's an unexplained disease where there is no cure, where a baby will scream, and they have screamed for 16 hours a day, and they've never stopped, but there's two of them. And that's not just on Monday, that's for four and a half months. So they never stop, and Candy and I have both agreed that 
that was the biggest struggle that we've ever gone through in our life. And we kept praying like, God, <laughs> what is this test now? You know, what's next is my line now. Um, and so th this is a song about when I, look at, at, when I looked at their faces and I said, you know, I would pray over them and lay my hands on them and say, Satan, you know, I rebuke you, Satan. If, if this is Satan, what, you know, what is this? Because we would go to doctors and there is no cure and they had it really, really bad. So was it, you know, was it the spirit attacking me at the same time I'm start trying to create music? Um, because Satan has tried to stop me endless amounts of times for creating this music with a message. And if you know ministry or heads of ministries, um, or if you know your Bible, it's written that when, <laughs> that when everyone in the world hears the word, that's when the Messiah is gonna appear. So now that we have the internet and we have that power of music that reaches global, um, this music can really save people and can get more and more. So Satan will come against whatever ministry you have, as you know, especially the bigger the ministry it is. And that's why you always see when ministry just gets really big, somehow it crumbles, doesn't it? And so Satan always tries to weave his way in. So that song is, is a song called Colic. Rep represents a very, very, very struggle that we, a very bad struggle that we got through. Good deal. Any more? Um, uh, yeah, that's good enough for now. <laughs> Anybody in the audience have questions? Step right on up to the sound booth here. I'm just curious if you have a name uh, for your group. Pick yeah. out. Yeah, actually I do, but I guess for now, it's, I'm not gonna say anything, so let it all come forth when it comes forth. So for now, you could just say it's Spitz's group with his best friends that Jesus appointed to him. <laughs> so based on your answer there, I'm guessing that you're not at liberty to divulge other individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly why I'm not playing the music too. Uh, <laughs> but wish I could. Hey, you know, Dan, this is this is way too awesome. It was probably 17, 18 years ago almost that I was staring at you on stage down in San Antonio, Texas with a couple other well-known secular bands, Slayer, Megadeth, and Alice in Chains, and a little thing called Clash of the Titans. And the fact that I'm standing here now and seeing you proclaim Christ in front of everybody, you know, I just rededicated myself about four years ago. And it's just an absolute right here is just proof that God does move in mysterious ways. Because like I say, I saw these guys Anthrax, Slayer, Testament, Megadeth years ago, and you guys were my first mosh pit. You and Slayer both, too bad I was way too tired from Megadeth that night. Cause, but you know what, it was a lot of fun then, and it's gonna be even more fun now because we got the man upstairs taking care of us all. Thank you. Amen. See, see look, like, he, he represents exactly what this is all about. That's it. If, if someone someone came and saw us play back then and and can confess like that, that blows my mind. That's what it's all about. That's, that, real quick, I want to say something real quick. That's an interesting point because you know we got a lot of emails on, on, on the on the websites when I became a Christian. You know, it really told me I was you know you're you're a sissy. You don't want to be yeah, you you know. But I, I'm, now I'm starting to get a lot of emails. From the other side from guys like you who say it's so great you know this is just wonderful mm -hmm. and it's real encouragement each one is real it's encouragement actually what because you, you do feel alone sometimes you know because you live that life for so long and now you hear and everybody who tells you man this is great and i love you man and this welcome to the family just makes it feel good it's really really good it, it takes a lot for 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 us to kind of step out and um sit up here and do this, it really does. Like I said, there's friends of mine that are some of those bands you named and other very huge bands that are saved, I know they're saved, but they can't get out, they're trapped. As we felt at, at one point, you're, you're trapped because you, you need to make a living. What do you do if you've been doing this one thing all your life where you know, your mother always told you, I have something to fall back on. Yeah, you know what you have to fall back on when you look at them? That's it. Um, when they walk off stage, most of them, you know, they don't have money. So what do they do even though they want to profess and make really good music for Jesus? And they have that ability to do so because they're blessed 
at a proficient musicianship that is at the top, they can't. They're stuck. They, they're in contractual obligations that could last many years. They get sued by everyone they owe money to for merchandising, for this, for that, for this, and it, and it wouldn't even fit on my one hand. So it's not easy when you say, I got saved, or, or you're looking from a, an audience perspective at, at a, um, somebody in heavy metal or another genre, where you, they say, they profess that they know Jesus, but you look at them and you judge, and you say, then why is he still playing that music? Because he can't get out. Satan has him trapped. It's that simple. I too am, am just like the guy who spoke before. I've, I've watched you guys on Headbangers Ball, both of you, you know, as a kid. And uh, Dan, I, I was, my mom wouldn't let me come to the Arcadia Theater in Dallas when you guys recorded those songs for I Am The Man, and I begged and begged, and she wouldn't let me. And uh, it's so awesome to see you guys here, and I just want to thank you for coming forward and, and tell you that I'm going to be praying for you guys, and uh, what you guys got coming out is, it's just so, so encouraging to see you guys here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to ask a question. How can the body of Christ support you guys? What sort of prayer requests would you like or things the body of Christ can do for you to help you guys? Um, just pray that um, the message that's within the music gets out and can save one. If the ministry saves one, then I'm happy. If God, um, if God blesses it beyond that, then it's in His hands, which it is anyway. But I'd be happy if I'm standing somewhere and some somebody comes backstage and says, "Dad, I wasn't saved before. I listened to your music. I was going through this troubled time in my life, or whatever this may be. Something happened, and this happened, and this event happened, and then that event happened, and then I'm saved." And thank you for your music. Because the stories we used to get about um, people and w what our music did for them were quite different than that, you know? It was, you know, maybe you save me from suicide, we've probably both got that many times, but it's not in the respect of what this music and the message should be. Because it's not just about the pounding feel of the music that, uh, that I always create. It really is about what he told me to write. You know, the idea, you know, I was, I was hoping that people, if somebody says, I want to pray for you, what should I pray for? I always wonder, I say, you know, that I stay humble and not prideful. And he said, you know, pride is such a, a big issue, you know, in my life. And it, I had to swallow a lot of pride and I want to swallow it all. But there's always a little bit left. It's hard to get rid of, you know, you're like, oh, check me out. So I want to stay humble. I want people to pray for me. Stay humble. We're all the same. We're all God's people. That's the only thing that matters. Not what I did before. Not what I'm not going to do in the future. It all doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that I stay humble and be there a good father for my kids. But be, be careful because someone once, once made me very confused when I was a, a young Christian um, slash Jew. <laughs> um, and they, they confused pride because actually one of the new songs is called Pride, Selfishness, and Greed. Um, they confuse pride with confidence. Don't confuse those two. You're allowed to have confidence. You're a warrior for Christ. You have extra confidence because you, 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 have, you have Jesus and you have all your angels surrounding you. you there's nothing can be formed against you. So have your confidence, but have it for Jesus. Don't confuse those two, please. Don't, don't feel you have to be this meek, weak, um, person because you got saved and you got Jesus in you. That's wrong because I see a lot of people like that. And then they're, they're humble but they're weak. You're supposed to be built up and be put back in the world when you're ready to save others. So gather your strength, gather your confidence, and go save others. We've got time for one more question from the audience. And I was waiting in line, I apologize, but uh, we do have a time schedule to stick to here. One more question. You guys have both alluded to this a little bit a couple times, but would you guys consider your old bands anti-Christian or as being a metal fan, is it still okay to 
listen to Russian roulette or Among the Living every now and then, or should you go burn them like they used to do in the 80s, or what, what would you guys say about that? That's an interesting question. I, I admit, you know, I, listen, I don't listen to my own stuff, but um, I still listen to ACDC because it's just bred into me. Um, I just speak for myself and I, you know, I try to live my, my life the best I can right now. Um, I don't consider it satanic. I don't consider it bad. You know, I just, it's not glorifying God. You know, my, my, my vision is for my life, the rest of my life, whatever I do, try to glorify God. So obviously ACDC is not, but still, you know, the roofs are in, in my blood and, and when I hear it, my legs go, I can't help it. <laughs> Probably the same with you guys. So, you know, I think, it, you know, I don't know. I think it's special for everybody else and everybody for himself. Well, there's there's also a common misconception that, you know, you, the, so when I walked in, you know, music is from Satan. Certain, certain notes are from Satan. Um, Peter and I both know these people who create the satanic music. And uh, some of it is, they're, they're not Satan, Satan, Satan worshipers. They just choose to write about a subject and the band gets labeled writing about that subject and the writer is good about writing about that subject. But if you feel yourself listening to that music and falling in as uh, a trap of Satan to keep pulling you away and all of a sudden now that music is bringing you to a group of new friends. You've got new friends. And uh, someone once said something to me that I, I repeat to almost everybody. Um, he said it's written in the Bible. He who you surround yourself with is he who you become. And if I could say one line for today for you to remember, that would be it. Because that music will bring you new friends. You'll go to a concert to see that band. And all of a sudden you'll find yourself drinking, smoking pot, or whatever it may be. And you're gonna, you know, you don't want to be over there. You feel very strong, and like for us, we listen to music for many different reasons. Um, listen to whatever you want. If, it, if you can't find it, that was my problem when I first got saved. Okay, now I'm saved, but I'm the creator of the heavy music. What do I listen to? To get my anger, or my angst, my, where is it? Where, where, where's the anthrax in the Christian music realm? What do I listen to? Delirious, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna have wonderful music, but it's not gonna make me be me, you know. So just be careful. Don't take the words for what they are. Is kind of what I'm trying to say. Some are real, you know. We have we have run into people that you know, you know, are burning stuff backstage. <laughs> you know, they, they do exist, but most of it's just show. Well, just a quick good example. There was somebody in, in my church that was saying, you're on the highway to hell. You know that song, Highway to Hell? That's satanic. And I explained to him, I said, the singer just basically said, he's on the highway to hell. He was, you know, and nobody ever told him about Jesus. And that's why he died. You know what I mean? If, if you really think about it, you know, it struck me more than anything to hear that. Dude, he's on the highway to hell. I think, yeah, he was. And nobody was there for him. So, for instance, uh, on, on the purpose, for sure. On this project, um, I had to pray about one of the members that, that's done some drum overdubs, because he's the drummer from a, from a satanic band called King Diamond. But, so from your perspective, why would Dan have the drummer from a satanic band do drum overdubs? After talking with the gentleman, I find out number one, he's Jewish, and number two, he plays in many Christian bands, and he's not a Satan worshiper, so perhaps I can save him. Is there something wrong with him playing on my music now? If you pray about it, it's between you and God, and you get the blessing to move forth, you're good to go, bro. I was gonna ask you for a final statement, but I think you guys have summed that up quite nicely. Peter from Accept, well, formerly from Accept, Dan Spitz, formerly from Anthrax, and your host, ladies and gentlemen, from HM Magazine, Doug Van Pelt. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much.